Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for coming this afternoon to see these incredible people talk on stage. My name is Becky. I'm the development director at KBU Community Radio. And hey! <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out in support of this amazing community station. Did you know we're turning 50 years old next year? <laughs> Dang. <laughs> so in 2018, we're looking to take a very deep look into Portland's history as told through the community radio lens. And we'll be having exhibits and parties and we're talking about archives and, and putting all of that out there. So stay tuned to find out a lot more. I'd also like you to thank me and, um, or thank me, thank you, thanks. Thanks, yeah, you're super welcome. Um, I would love for you to join me in thanking our sponsors and partners in this for whom we wouldn't be able to put on such an event. I'd like to thank our venue, the Aladdin Theater, thank you. Yay! Thank you so much. Open Signal Portland Community Media. Yay! They're taping today. And the Jupiter Hotel, thank you so much for your partnership. And the Barnes & Noble Lloyd Center for providing books in the service of book selling out in the front. Yay! Um, I have one more announcement before I pass the mic on to um, our next speaker. Um, I have... Uh, the Portland Indivisible and Unite Oregon are holding a candlelight vigil for the victims of yesterday's hate crime at 8.30 this evening at the Hollywood Northeast 42nd Max Transit Center. So please join if you are able. And it's my supreme pleasure and honor to introduce you to today's MC. Christine Dupree is an enrolled Kellett's citizen writer and proud KBU volunteer. Please join me in welcoming Christine. Thank you, thank you Becky, and thank you Chris and Joe so much. Um, I think Becky said it, but I'll say it again. All proceeds today will go to benefit KBU Community Radio. Yeah, yeah. They are, they are a force for good and a force for sanity here in this world. And I appreciate them and I appreciate all of you for coming out to hear these two today. Um, Christopher Hedges, I know that you've read these bios and I know you know why you're here, um, is an American journalist, a Princeton professor and a Presbyterian minister. Joe Sacco is an American journalist and cartoonist born in Malta and a graduate of the University of Oregon. He also lives here in Portland. I know, I know, there is a luminary among us. Um, each is an estimable writer, creator, and social conscience for this vulnerable place and time. Um, they share among them a Pulitzer Prize and an American Book Award, just for example. Yeah, so there's much I could say, but I really wanted to ask each of them today to say something that perhaps you wouldn't read, right, if you pulled up Wikipedia. So here goes. Um, I'll start with you, Joe. What is something that inspires you about Chris? Integrity, I'd say. I mean, um, I've worked with Chris. We spent a lot of time together. I was the best man at one of his weddings. Um, I know him very well. But honestly, he's... Um, I think he's a towering intellect. I think he's incredibly well-read. And I think he's probably if not the most important voice in America today, he's certainly up there in the top two or three. So, um, and I'm really proud to know him. I'm very proud to know him. Thank you. I appreciate those heartfelt words. 
So same question for you, but for Joe, what inspires you? So I did a ra uh, interview on Cebu, and he was in El Salvador, and uh, I told I sent him an email and told him that I'd mentioned him on the radio and uh, told the listeners that uh, he was a nudist who uh, <laughs> did all his work by dropping acid. <laughs> oh, I wish. But I I the truth that. is, <laughs> uh, I, I said that I think he's a, a creative genius, um, that he uh, created <laughs> a narrative, repertorial form of the highest journalistic integrity that had never been created before. And he had a vision, and I knew him when he was a lot poorer than he is now. <laughs> uh, and he just was relentless. And it was marrying that talent that he has as an artist with um, his seriousness as a writer and a reporter. And uh, we met in uh, Bosnia. Neither of us have had enough drinks to tell the good stories. Um, but we, we were uh, on a French convoy going to one of the safe areas called Garajda. And uh, by the time I got to the convoy, I was late. And he wasn't very happy to see me because he kept hearing from the French officers no, no, we must wait for the New York Times. Um, <laughs> but I remember all the way out there, we talked about books, I think Celine, among others. But what was, for me, amazing was we did some interviews together and I watched him work. I, hadn't, I wasn't familiar with his work. And it was clear that I was in the presence of a really serious reporter. Um, and one of the things that we did a book together, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. Um, and I came back, I think, from South Dakota or somewhere. And I told my wife, um, it, I would sit and do a two or three hour interview. And then Joe, who was largely silent, would ask all the questions I should have asked and forgot to ask, and it drove me nuts. Um, but he has, um, I mean, I don't use that word genius lightly, he has that genius, but he also has, I think like all great artists and writers, a profound empathy for the oppressed, and um, his book, Garajda, if you don't, I mean his book, uh, Footnotes in Gaza, if you don't have it, is uh, one of the finest books on the Israeli-Palestine conflict, including, of course, his first book, Palestine, is brilliant. Um, but Footnotes in Gaza is, and it was going back and telling a story of the massacres in Gaza, carried out by the Israelis, uh, when they occupied under the Suez Crisis, 56, right? That no one had told. And it took him six years to do. Um, and I can guarantee you by the time he's done, he wasn't even working for minimum wage. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, that capacity to sacrifice. I mean, the fact that he would tell the story of Garajda and not Sarajevo. I mean, uh, and Garajda was much worse than Sarajevo. So, um, you know, there are very, very few artists, writers, journalists I respect more than Joe Sacco. Thank you. You're buying dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I bought it last night. <laughs> I'm not buying it. Uh, so... Three years ago, these two set out to write Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, and they went to areas called now the Sacrifice Zones. 
basically where corporate rule and marketplace rule takes over and lives that are powerful are at risk, if not demeaned and diminished. So that was three years ago. They did this together. And today, they're back to talk a bit about what, if anything, has changed since 2014. And that's enough for me. I'm handing it over. Thank you, Christine. Um, I was quite enjoying that, that long pain to my brilliance. But anyway. <clears throat> All right. Welcome to Portland, Chris. Um, you're, you're mostly Portlanders, I imagine. And uh, like a lot of Portlanders, you're very proud of your city. You love your city, like I do. Um, and Portland gets a lot of good press. But there are some pretty dark undercurrents in the United States today. And w those dark undercurrents exist in Portland, too. And some of you long-term residents will know uh, about some of those undercurrents, the history of racism in the city. Um, yesterday, uh, a man yelling anti-Muslim epithets uh, assaulted a couple of young women and three men intervened to uh, help them and two of those men were killed and one of them was sent to hospital. These are very brave men, obviously. Uh, it's very tragic and it's, uh, it's kind of astonishing, but I guess this is the world we live in now. And I guess the first question I have is, are we living in a particular moment now or are we living in a continuum of what America has always been? Both. Yeah. Um, racism, violence have always been part of the American DNA, as any African-American or person of color knows, or woman. And those forces have been traditionally harnessed by the centers of power to do the dirty work on behalf of the ruling elites. We had the bloodiest labor wars in the industrialized world, hundreds of American workers were murdered. And many of them were murdered by mercenaries, Baldwin Feltz, Pinkertons, gun thugs. The reign of terror that was carried out after emancipation by quasi-military groups from the white leagues to the Klan that have a direct uh, connection with the old slave patrols. So we are a very violent society. We are a society that has never dealt with the reality of white supremacy, as Baldwin reminds us, which is how we end up with a figure like Trump and Bannon and Miller and the racists who now, the overt racists who run the country. But this is a unique moment in a sense that our democratic institutions, which were always imperfect, no longer function. And so what happens when an open society is destroyed is that those forces that were on the margins of society, although they were utilized by the ruling elites, are able to fill the political vacuum. And that's what's happened. Um, and that's what always happens when a cabal, corporate, monarchist, fascist, communist seizes power at the expense of the rest of the population. The legitimate rage and frustration coughs up these grotesque figures as it did in Yugoslavia where Joe and I both were. Radovan Karadzic was as buffoonish a figure 
as Donald Trump, and they knew he was buffoonish. You forget that before 1933, the Nazis were buffoonish. And so it's both. And it's very dangerous. Because what's happened is that, in essence, the corporate kleptocracy, which has been in place now for, certainly since the Clinton administration, no longer has to pretend. There's no pretense. The mask is off. And, and in many ways, Trump is the real visage of the darkness underneath. Um, and the only way that we're going to rectify what's happened is through mass mobilization, civil disobedience, and a destruction of these corporate institutions, and in particular, the fossil fuel industry. Um, but there's no one or no institution, including the press, of course, that's going to do it for us. Um, so as Trump's base realizes that they have been conned, we will see the stoking of hate talk and hate crimes, such as what happened here, uh, become more pervasive within the, within the wider society. Now, what about someone like uh, Barack Obama? I mean, the idea was we were going to move into a post-racial world somehow. Um, is there such a thing as a post-racial world? Are we perfectible in that way? No, a post-racial world would require whites to confront the reality of white supremacy and white history and the actual instruments that created the American empire. And those instruments were genocide and slavery. The utter failure on the part, or refusal, on the part of the white majority to confront the evil within allows them to continue what they have always done which is externalize evil, their own evil, onto the other. And Barack Obama, for me, was a very troubling figure because unlike his predecessor, George W. Bush, who was kind of clueless, Barack Obama is intelligent and knew very well what he was doing, very cynical, I think. Um, and that's why you see in states like Michigan and Wisconsin, many people who voted for Trump had voted for Obama in 2008. And Obama did come in with a mandate, but he played to political expediency. He became, as Cornel West said, a black mascot for Wall Street. And I think he squandered what in many ways may, be, may have been the last opportunity for us to right the American state, in particular on the issue of, of climate change. Um, Obama, Obama's assault on civil liberties was worse than under Bush. The use of the Espionage Act to shut down journalists who had been leaked information about government crimes and fraud and lies, the interpretation of the 2001 Authorization to Use Military Force Act as giving the executive branch the right to assassinate American citizens, the after the Snowden revelations refusal to dismantle the wholesale surveillance which keeps all of us monitored 24 hours a day, our email, our phone records, 
our medical records, our judicial records. And when you are watched 24 hours a day, you cannot use the word free. That is the relationship of a master and a slave. And of course, Obama pushed through Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act. And I sued him in federal court over it. And that overturns the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act, which prohibits the military from acting as a domestic police force. And when the Obama administration appealed the ruling in the Southern District Court of New York, which they did immediately, we began a two-year legal battle in the Second Circuit or Appellate Court, which refused to accept my standing. They wouldn't rule on the case because it's so patently unconstitutional, in the same way that privacy is patently, the, the stripping of privacy, warrantless uh, monitoring and seizure of information under the Fourth Amendment. And so they denied my standing. We filed a petition to the Supreme Court known as a cert to ask them to hear it. They wouldn't hear it. And in that two-year struggle, the lawyers, Carl Mayer and Bruce Afron, went to the Democratic House leadership under Pelosi and said, because it's renewed every year, all you have to do is insert into that section that this does not apply to American citizens or US citizens, and we will drop the lawsuit. But of course, they wouldn't insert it because it was designed to empower the government in times of distress or unrest to carry out, in essence, the extraordinary rendition of American citizens from the streets of their own cities and hold them without due process in military facilities until, quote unquote, the end of hostilities, which in an age of permanent wars forever. So all of this came down under Obama. Um, and what will happen when these people, desperate, I mean, half the country lives in poverty. What will happen when they realize they've been betrayed by Trump? I think it's clear that the, Trump and those around him will do what all fascists or proto-fascists do, and that is ramp up this kind of demonization of the vulnerable undocumented workers, Muslims, African Americans, GBLT intellectuals. Um, we're already seeing a war on the press called enemies of the American people. So I don't, we don't know the specifics of what happened last night. There's some indication from at least some of the reports I read that the person who carried out the ta attack had mental health issues. Um, but I think that the cruelty and hate that this person exhibited mirrors the kind of systemic cruelty and hate of a society that's thrown its mentally ill out on the street, or 25% of our prison population has severe mental illness. The cruelty of a country that is now pushing through, and the Democrats were complicit in this, cuts that sustain the most vulnerable among us, children, the elderly, people with disabilities, people in our public school system, that's a process. Clinton destroyed welfare. He destroyed a welfare system, and, and under the old welfare system, 70% of the recipients were children. That was Clinton. So this corporate coup d'etat is complete. They no longer need the pretense that figures like Obama or Clinton had, where they spoke in that traditional feel your pain language of liberalism, but assiduously served corporate power. And what ha that has done is it has created not just 
a political crisis and an economic crisis and a cultural crisis, but an existential crisis. Because, and this is true, was true in Yugoslavia, it was true in Weimar, is that people turn on these self-identified liberal figures, I would not call them liberal any more than I would call the press liberal, but self-identified liberal figures. And they reject not only, as happened in the last election, that self-identified liberal elite, but the so-called liberal values themselves. Because those values have been rendered meaningless in the hands of a bankrupt liberal class. And that's exactly what we're watching. And the, the press, by repeating this mantra that Hillary Clinton lost the election because of Comey or the elections, is refusing to deal with the reason the Democrats have been pushed out of power, and that's because they betrayed working men and women. So f fascism, authoritarianism, totalitarianism always rise out, rises out of a, a market economy or a capitalist democracy that ceases to function. And we are following that historical precedent. Yeah, um, you have a line from one of your books. I think it's uh, very apropos. You say, stories of rage begin as stories of despair. I wrote a book, uh, I spent two years on it, called American Fascists, the Christian Right, and the War on America. I was trying to reach out to him. Um, <laughs> and I uh, went to seminary. My father was a Presbyterian minister, and I teach in a prison for which I've been ordained. But I, I didn't really understand who these people were. And I didn't use the word fascist lightly. In fact, before I put it, Bill Moyers tried to talk me out of putting it in the title. And I, I love Bill. I mean, he's the, he was the last figure on public television who had a show that dealt seriously with power. I mean, he's somebody I respect very much. And so I went to... Um, Robert Paxton, who is a scholar on Vichy and wrote The Anatomy of Fascism and spent about three hours with him laying out what I saw as the tenets of the Christian right so that I could be argued out of that title. And I, I, there was nothing he said that dissuaded me from calling them fascists. And then I went and saw Fritz, Fritz Stern, uh, the great scholar, also of fascism, left Germany as a, a teenager, uh, fled Germany in the late 30s, and wrote The Politics of Cultural Despair, which is the book about the antecedents of fascism. He, he once said to me that in Germany there was a yearning for fascism before the word fascism was invented. And I, I found within the movement um, very clear fascist elements. I feel that the liberal church failed by giving these people credibility. They are not Christians. They are heretics. They have fused the worst aspects of American capitalism and American imperialism with the Christian religion. And this is also not without precedent. The so-called German Christian church in Germany was the pro-Nazi Protestant church that the majority of Germans attended. I had a professor at Harvard named James Luther Adams who in 1936 and 37 was at the University of Heidelberg. He took classes with Heidegger who would begin his lectures with the Nazi salute. He dropped out of the university and he joined the underground confessing church led by Niemöller, Bonhoeffer, 
uh, Karl Barth, Schweitzer. And I had, when I had him at Harvard, he was 80. And he told us that when we were his age, we would all, in America, we would all be fighting the Christian fascists. Because when you disempower and disenfranchise your working class, and you create a movement that fuses the iconography and language of the state with the iconography and language of the Christian religion, it's a recipe for fascism. And if you look at the structures of megachurches, they are fascist. The white male pastor who is in touch with God and who can never be questioned, absolute authority, and sitting through many of those events, and I went all over the country, Kansas, Florida, I watched how those churches did something that Hannah Arendt cited as fundamental to totalitarian movements. She said they begin with the propaganda. So that's the church service with the music and the chairs that are actually comfortable and everybody telling you how much they want you to join their family. I, I did a, uh, it's called Evangelism Explosion with D. James Kennedy. I did a it's a seminar about how to get people to accept Christ into their life. And what was fascinating about the seminar is how cold and calculating it was. That there was no Jesus talk. It was all about we have to find people who just lost their jobs or a family member just died or they just got divorced. They're in some kind of crisis. We have to go in groups of three and hang on every word they say. It comes out of Margaret Singer's book, Cults in Our Midst, it's called Love Bombing. But what they do is they suck you into the environment. And then, as Aaron said, they move you into another environment, which is indoctrination. So what we don't see in the megachurches behind the scenes, and people who come out of this system, especially children who've spoken to me after the book, really deal with serious trauma. So all of their recreation time, entertainment time, educational time, is consumed and they are given disciplers so they don't backslide. And what was heartbreaking is I would sit in these prayer groups and people would be weeping because members of their family hadn't been saved. And they talk about family, but in fact, the institutions of the Christian writer, the great destroyer of family, and they, uh, they break you down in the same way that a cult breaks you down. I came, I never put it in the book because it was anecdotal, but every woman that I interviewed, every, I think every single one without exception, had suffered sexual or physical violence. And I went to a pro-life weekend in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania for about 400 women. They asked all the post-abortive sisters to stand. The whole room stood. I started doing interviews and it turned out that they had often had multiple abortions. They were being taken away for weekends, retreats, and given a doll and told that that doll represented the child they had murdered. And they had to name the doll and dress the doll and bathe the doll and at the end of the weekend, offer up that doll as a symbol of their dead child, beg for forgiveness, and commit themselves to fighting the culture of death, which is us. This is what happens internally in this group. And it's, it's actually an important issue because Trump has no political ideology. I mean, I'm going crazy with, uh, I, only time, I don't have a TV, so the only time I see Wolf Blitzer is when I'm at the gym. <laughs> but it's, it's like, what did Donald Trump say in 2000? It doesn't matter what Donald Trump said. Uh, if you haven't figured out that he's a complete con artist by now. <laughs> but as things devolve, that ideological void will be filled by the Christian right under Pence. 
And everyone is, of course, he's a huge embarrassment to the empire. And the empire may get rid of him, the deep state. But Trump is the symptom. He is not the disease. Okay, I think, uh, let me ask one more question before we go on to questions from the audience. And uh, uh, you can pass your questions to the center of the aisles, I guess. They'll be picked up. Now, um, yeah, you've talked about Christian fascists, but you're also ordained. And you've met many people, as I have, along the way who have faith and have the religious impulse in the best possible sense. You've spent time in El Salvador with Jesuit priests doing great work, liberation theology. Uh, Martin Luther King came out of the church, for example. So you don't have a problem with those people in that sense, right? And you, you've famously taken on atheists. So do you want to talk about that at all? I mean, talk about the, well, the positive I, aspect. So I debated faith. Sam Harris at uh, UCLA, and then I debated Christopher Hitchens in Berkeley. And... Chomsky calls them uh, religious fanatics for the state religion. Um, I think they're secular fundamentalist. Fundamentalism is a mindset. It's not exclusive to religiosity. And that is why their political agenda completely converges with the Christian right. So the Christian right will call Muslims satanic, and the new atheists will call Muslims barbaric. Um, and the fact is both groups want to bomb them back to the Stone Age. I mean, Sam Harris's book, The End of Faith, calls for us to consider carrying out a nuclear first strike on the Muslim world. And their binary worldview replicates the binary worldview of the Christian fanatics. Black and white, good and evil. They use different words to code it. They believe that, um, I mean, I think Harris is in the, when he calls for us to consider a nuclear first strike, said it would be a crime, but given what those people believe, we may have no other choice. That's one fifth of the world's population, by the way. And I, I think that they are just mirror images of each other. And Hitchens, of course, was once a Trotskyite. And if you look at people who come out of those rigid ideological systems, they often can swing very swiftly, as he did, all the way to the other side. So he, after 9-11, and, and I, the other thing that was interesting as a kind of anecdote is that when you read Hitchens and Harris, the trigger for their conversion was 9-11. And really what it is was fear. And they wanted the empire to go and kill all the people that they felt were threatening them. Um, so I find the new atheist movement, I wrote a book on it, um, which didn't sell terribly well because most Christians consider me an atheist and of course, the new atheists consider me a believer. When I debated, I debated the Christian right. And debating the Christian right, like Tony Perkins and these figures, was exactly like debating Harris or Hitchens. Because they can only debate their caricature of you. They don't actually operate in the world of ideas. They've never read theology. They've never read Niebuhr or Tillich or Bard or Feuerbach or anyone else. And so they have to reduce you to their cartoon vision. So at the end of the debate with Harris, which is, you can watch it on YouTube, he says, I feel like it's the 15th century and we're arguing about witches. And I don't believe in witches. I don't, I mean, God is a human concept. I fully accept that there's no historical evidence that Jesus ever existed. I mean, I don't buy any of that. But they can't argue on that level. And the same with the Christian fundamentalists. They will constantly argue that I'm a secular humanist, I'm a secular humanist. It doesn't matter what you say. 
And it is that intellectual ossification. I mean, it, it would be like me debating Dawkins about biology, having read Peterson's Field Guide to Birds, and that was it. <laughs> well, you know, they, they can't, they can't, they don't work in the, in nuance. They don't work in the realm of ideas. They don't cope with ambiguity. Um, and I think that they are, and you know, I, some of you know I've had my differences with the black bloc. Um, but I think they come out of that kind of rigidity which is mirrored in the radical right. And when societies break down, unfortunately, it is those polarized extremes who take over. And the majority of us in the center, if you want to call it that, who become the victims. Um, let's talk about, because um, you know, we talk about uh, these problems and everything, and you've, you know, we, can, we can address some of these things in a piecemeal fashion. Um, we've, we can talk about movements. But what I would like to get from you is a vision of what the world should look like or what's, let's say what's possible for it to look like in, in the best sense. Because I think we need to develop alternative visions of reality and not just resist. If we don't destroy the capitalist system, we're gonna go extinct. What does that mean? It means that all of our utilities, our railroads, our banks are nationalized. It means that taxes are so punitive on the fossil fuel industry that it's not profitable for them to take things out of the ground. It means that the empire is dismantled and the war machine is reduced to a defensive force that consumes a tiny percentage of our budget. It means campaign finance, so nobody is allowed to accept money from corporations to run for political office. It means a return of justice, which will see figures like Lloyd Blankfein and Dick Cheney I'm kind of against prison, but um, in some form of punitive. <laughs> it means free public education, including at the university of level for all. It means health care as a human right. It means a robust system of public broadcasting so voices that are not beholden to the elites have a platform. It means a massive funding of culture and the arts. And finally, it means an honest examination of who we are as white Americans and what we have done in the same way that after World War II, the Germans, unlike the Austrians, looked themselves in the face. And until we as white Americans do that, we are going, as Baldwin said, to perpetuate this house of the dead. Well, Chris has my vote. <laughs> um, I'm curious how we're going to get there. Uh, I agree with everything you've said, actually, but uh, is it through electoral politics? No. It's, it's not going to be through electoral politics. It's going to be by creating mass movements non through nonviolence, as I saw in Eastern Europe. And that means day after day in the street, it means, as Max Weber said, politics becoming a vocation. I covered 
the fall of the communist government in East Germany. In the fall of 1989, and these movements were very amorphous when they began. They were mostly Lutheran clergy and congregants walking through the streets of Leipzig with candles, and their initial demand was that they wanted just to be recognized, have legal status. By the end, 70,000 people were marching through the streets of Leipzig. Eric Honecker sent down an elite paratroop division to fire on the crowd, and when they got there, the local communist authorities prohibited them. There's stories of them going into the barracks and the paratroopers were weeping because many of them had family members in Leipzig. That's why revolutions are fundamentally nonviolent, because as Crane Brinton and Jeffrey Davies, two of the best theorists on revolution, have pointed out, no revolution succeeds until significant forces of the ruling elites, including internal security, either defect or refuse to defend them. And that's, that's what we have to do. In the same way that in Spain, 10,000 people surrounded the parliament. That's what we have to do. Um, I don't know if it's going to happen, um, but I certainly know that sitting around waiting for Chuck Schumer to save us isn't going to work. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a few questions uh, that we have compiled here. I'll read them to you, Chris. First one is, what guidance can we give our grandchildren to prepare for their future? That, I mean, I have children, and I do what I do because even if I fail, I want my kids to look back and say that their father tried. We have utterly betrayed those who are coming after us. We have failed to be stewards of our society and of this great planet Earth. And they are gonna pay the price. And every time you feel complacent or depressed or hopeless, you have to carry out acts of resistance if for no other reason than to assert yourself as an autonomous and moral individual and to make a statement that at least those who know you will remember. And it's unpleasant. It will become dangerous. Going to jail is more time than I care to donate to this government. But if, if, we don't, if we don't do it, then, then we extinguish the possibility of hope. We can't use the word hope if we don't resist. That's what makes hope palpable and real. And when, and I'm about to, I'm, we'll take part in the Veterans for Peace protest against the wars in Washington on the 30th, when you carry out those acts, they are strangely empowering. Uh, a few years ago, 133 veterans and I were arrested protesting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in front of the White House, which is also on YouTube, and it was snowing. And Watermelon Slim, a blues musician and a Vietnam veteran, played taps on his harmonica. And several veterans folded the flag of a kid who'd been killed in Afghanistan a few weeks before. And someone beat a drum, and everyone was silent. And they marched to the White House fence and did not move until we were arrested. And a lot of us were crying, a lot of us who'd been in war. And for me, that's my church. That's where I find my spiritual sustenance. It's where I find my community. I 
don't believe in spirituality. For me, faith is about confrontation. It is about challenging radical evil on behalf of life. And when we were cuffed, it turns out that most of the police were in the National Guard and had been in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they would cuff us, and they would whisper in our ear, keep protesting. And that terrifies the state. But it isn't going to work if we don't go. I mean, as Ralph Nader said, if you want democracy, you got to show up. And there's no shortage of injustices in Portland, whether it is the jacking up of your rents by the oligarchs, whether it is homeless, hate crimes, it's all there. It's everywhere. Well, the first story I wrote, I was 16, as a kid, I'd, I'd gotten a scholarship to a very elite boarding school in Connecticut. And this school had insane amounts of money. The Rockefellers had gone there. But the kitchen workers lived up above the kitchen in appalling conditions. And no student was allowed to go up there. So, of course, I went up there with a camera, <laughs> and I decided that the most effective issue to print these pictures and write about their living conditions would be the commencement issue when all the parents and the trustees were there. <laughs> and I did, and I embarrassed that school. And they spent the summer renovating the quarters for the pot washers and the cooks. And when I came back in the fall, those kitchen workers had pitched in and put a plaque on the wall in my memory. <laughs> that, for me, was what journalism is about. That's why I became a journalist, not to be objective or neutral, which is all crap anyway. Um, <laughs> but it was to make the world a better place, especially for the oppressed. <laughs> so I think resistance will ignite locally around specific issues. I mean, I, as Joe may have mentioned, I teach in a prison because I never want the oppressed to be an abstraction. As a reporter, I spent 20 years in the developing world, Central America, the Middle East, the Balkans, much of my time in Gaza. Because when the oppressed are not an abstraction, but you have real and profound relationships with them, then you can't betray them. I walk out of that prison, I'm the only one who can walk out. And I'm angry. I'm angry at what we've done to these people. And as Augustine says, hope has two beautiful daughters. Anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they don't remain the way they are. Okay, here's a philosophical question. Is evil inherent to humankind? Is it a latent seed within us all? Yes. And I know that from war. I know how easily people be can become acculturated to committing atrocity. How thin the line is between the victim and the victimizer. And if you don't know that, you can't fight evil. If you don't recognize that all of us 
within us have the capacity for monstrous evil, then in times of distress, that evil will take over. But if you recognize that we can all be seduced and that that is a human reality, then it gives you protection. And the great writers on morality, from Primo Levi to Alexander Solzhenitsyn, grapple with that fundamental truth. And if you haven't read the Gulag Archipelago, it'd be a good time to read it. Or uh, Survival in Auschwitz by Levy. We all have the capacity to be evil either through our actions or through our silence. Christopher Browning's Reserve Battalion Police 101 is a very good study of this. It was a reserve battalion of police, all of whom were in their 40s, none of whom were Nazi party members, most of whom were fathers, sent to Poland as part of the execution squads, the Einsengruppen, I think their unit killed close to 40,000 Jews, including children. But you have to know. I covered war for a long time. Physical courage I saw a lot of. I very rarely saw moral courage. Because moral courage forces you to defy the collective and the group. So that in units that I was in, there were most soldiers and marines are not psychopaths. But there are always about 2% who are psychopaths. So that when you go through a mud-walled village in Iraq, just for the sheer fun of it, they would take their belt-fed saw and unleash it on the mud and waddle huts along the side of the road. But the problem was that nobody in the unit would stop them. Or report them. Because once you take a moral stance like that, you not only become a pariah, but you put your own life in jeopardy. And fear has an amazing way of making you think with another part of your brain, and I speak from personal experience. And fear, when you live in a fearful environment, means that courage is never a constant. I have done things in the 20 years as a war correspondent that I look back on with great shame. I was in the middle of a coup d'etat in Khartoum with my best friend at the time, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. It was all the lights were out, the electricity was out, we turned the corner, we ran into the presidential guard, they didn't know who we are and we heard them all flick the safeties off their automatic weapons. And without thinking, I stepped, I was a few paces behind him, deftly in back of him, so the bullets would go through him first. And I think we have to be in touch with our own capacity for cowardice and for fear and even for evil if we're going to protect ourselves from it. And the problem with fundamentalists and nationalists is that, and white supremacists, is that they always externalize evil. Evil is always embodied in the dehumanized form of the other that when is eradicated, when those forms are eradicated means evil will disappear. But of course that's always the beginning of a greater evil. We may have seen a bit of that yesterday, unfortunately, on the Max line. Um, Given the Portland police response to white supremacists has been protection and the response to leftist civil disobedience has been to attack, what organizational strategies should we use for dissent? So at the end of my book, American Fascists, I came to the conclusion that we were never going to argue these people out of their insane beliefs that the entire earth was created in six days and 
Adam and Eve were real people who put saddles on the dinosaurs. Uh, you go to the Creation Museum in Peterborough, Kentucky, you can see a recreation of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve are these plastic figures standing in a waterfall. Eve's turned, of course, so you can't see her breasts or anything. And there's a saddle on a T-Rex. And the guide says, uh, well, I'm sure you're all wondering why there's a saddle on T-Rex and why T-Rex has such big teeth. The T-Rex had such big teeth because Adam and Eve used the T-Rex to open the coconuts. <laughs> and then you go into the next room and it's a replica of Noah's Ark and the guide says, I know you all want to know how Noah got the dinosaurs on the Ark. Noah only put baby dinosaurs on the Ark. <laughs> well, none of this is rational and actually it, it's funny here, but it's not funny when you're standing in a group of 40 people who believe it. And I, I came to the conclusion that these people were in such despair, having interviewed them, about all of the attendant psychological and emotional and physical problems, economic problems that come with the breakdown of community, that we were not going to rationally bring them back into a reality-based orbit. We would only blunt this movement by integrating them back into the economy and giving them stability. Because I went to a weekend with Tim LaHaye in Detroit. It was kind of appropriately situated in an end times weekend. And it was all about how the world would be destroyed and believers would have their eyes pop. I mean, it's really gory. And I realized that for those people, they love it. I mean, they were excited because that world out there, the world of drugs and alcohol and uh, pornography, that real world had come inches from destroying their own lives. And they wanted that world destroyed in an apocalyptic end time scenario. And so how are we gonna blunt these forces? If you attempt to speak about the realities of evolution or biology or geology, you are stripping these people of the only ideological framework that keeps them whole. And I don't think it's gonna work. I think what's gonna work is walking in there, however repugnant the things may be that come out of their mouths and say, we're here to fight for the $15 minimum wage. <laughs> we're here to make sure that your children's school budget is not cut. We're here to make sure that your water is not poisoned. It's too late, right. <laughs> and I think those are the issues by which, if you want to use the word, we will bring them back. But not by confronting them. I mean, this was why I was so critical of the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. Because as Joe will tell you, and he's been there as well, when you're in a refugee camp like Jabalia or Hani Yunus. Remember, if you're a Palestinian in Gaza, you have no travel documents. You are in the world's largest open air prison. You are sleeping 10 to 20 on a concrete floor. You do not have potable water. You do not have a job. You have nothing. The only thing that gives you your identity and sense of dignity is that of being an observant Muslim, and it is that structure of praying five times a day that is the only real structure in your life. And to watch rich, white, privileged Europeans taunt these figures, for me, obviously I condemn the hate crime that was carried out against Hebto, but I found it was so deeply insensitive to the reality of the oppressed. And I think that, you know, it is our job 
to understand. To understand is not to condone, but we must understand. There's a reason that someone will put on a suicide vest and blow themselves up. And we're not doing ourselves or them or anyone else a favor by pretending it's because they read the Quran, which, by the way, condemns suicide. We have to begin to grasp what, especially as an imperial power, we have done. If you remember the Jordanian pilot was captured by ISIS, put in a cage, and lit on fire. Well, day after day, an airstrike and missile strike, we were incinerating family after family. Our militarized drones have decapitated far more people, including children, than ISIS has ever decapitated. And they put that pilot in there and burn them. It's cruder, it's maybe more barbaric, but it's what we've been doing to them. And we must begin to understand who we are and the causal relationship that we have to both the fanaticism at home and abroad. Okay, the, this question, um, we didn't really get to it in, in a certain way. It's, it's more about um, civil disobedience and about police response, which uh, the person who's asking the question says, there's, there are attacks on civil disobedience and, and what are our organizational strategies when that happens? In fact, what would you tell a policeman if he was in the audience? I've had policemen in the audience. Um, I was giving a talk at Zuccotti Park and uh, I was exhorting uh, the members at Zuccotti not to verbally taunt the police. And the demeanor of the blue uniformed police in New York would change when the white shirts, we call them the white shirts, the officers would come. And if you look like the three women who were kettled and uh, pepper sprayed that first week, those were all white shirts. And I was telling the members of the park, well, look, we only have to deal with the white shirts an hour a day. Those guys have to deal with white shirts all day long. I actually said assholes all day long. <laughs> and after Zuccotti was shut down a few months later, I was giving a talk in New York, and a guy came up in the audience and he said, I am a white shirted asshole and I read all of your books. <laughs> I am sure he's the only one, but. Uh, it was a lesson I should have known, having read King, that if we treat even the forces, the foot soldiers, let's call them, of repression, and remember they're working class, with respect. Yes, I teach in a prison. I mean, there's a percentage of COs who are sadists who come back with PTSD from having, and you're not going to reach them. But if you can reach even a third or a quarter or something, that creates paralysis within the structures of power. And protesting and resistance is not about our catharsis. It's not about how we feel. It is about overthrowing corporate power. And I'm not going to defend what the police do. On the other hand, I think it's pretty clear what the effective strategy is to destroy this system. And this again gets back to my confrontation with the black bloc. Any, read any counterinsurgency manual. And at very near the top of the list of priorities is to isolate and demonize the protest movement. And that's, the black bloc plays completely into their hands. Half of them are cops anyway, I think. And they, I mean, you had 1,500 or more people at Berkeley, nonviolent protest over Ann Coulter, who of course should not be allowed to speak at a university. And 
And, but what were the images? Oakland. I mean, Oakland built an amazing Occupy resistance. They shut down the port. And I was getting phone calls from friends of mine like Ishmael Reed and other longtime African-American leaders out of Oakland going, who are these guys? Reed goes, they're throwing rocks through our windows. He said, I don't care if they throw rocks, but we'll drive them up to La Jolla where Romney lives. They can throw rocks through his window. <laughs> but they're parasitic and that they graft onto nonviolent groups. I mean, I don't know the dynamics. We had a very small black bloc contingent in New York, so they never had any real power. But they wouldn't go to the General Assembly. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be part of the structure. They wouldn't be part of the consensus. And so I think we have to recognize what the goals of the state are. I think we have to accept that we will never defeat these structures through violence. I've seen what this state is capable of having spent many years on the outer reaches of empire. We have 60,000 members of the special forces alone. And let me tell you what those forces are. They're death squads. And if the state needs them, they'll use them. They're already using them by bringing them back as contractors and mercenaries. So when I went to Standing Rock, they're blocking all, we're trying to get in all the back roads. We're stopped not by law enforcement, not by local police, we're stopped by private contractors. No insignia, no identification, long-barreled weapons. So I think we have to, as difficult as it is, be incredibly disciplined in our resistance. Um, and that really goes back to Gandhi, King, much of, you know, the effective resistance of the African National Congress by the end was not violent. Mandela never denounced violence, but by the end he wasn't practicing violence, the ANC. It was non-cooperation. And that's what we have to do. Um, I mean, we have the power to shut down this country. We have it. And, and, and rev people who have studied revolutionary movements have said you only need three to five percent of a deeply committed population to do it. And that is our only hope. And we cannot drive away the masses. What terrified the security and surveillance state were not a bunch of kids dressed in black with handkerchiefs over their mouths. It was on the weekends in Zuccotti when those mothers and fathers would come and push the strollers up and down the park. That's what scared them. What scared them is when the teachers went on strike in Chicago and when they would go into the precinct houses to use the bathroom and the police would applaud. That's what scares them. And we don't have any time to fool around. We have no time left. And my goal is the utter destruction of this corporate kleptocracy and the institutions that sustain it. And, that it, and it's not about how I feel or where I, it, that, it, all of that's irrelevant. And I'm interested only in the most effective strategy to overthrow these people. Well, I think that's a pretty good end point, but before we, uh, before we leave the stage, Chris, uh, you work in the prison, you've worked uh, uh, with theater in the prison, and uh, you wanted to tell people here something about that. So, uh, two years, I teach, and have now for about 10 years, teach uh, college credit courses in the New Jersey prison system. I teach uh, different courses every semester. I taught a course last year a history course called Conquest. Uh, we read Open Veins of Latin America, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and C.L.R. James's Black Jacobins. Um, and I taught a drama class where we read August Wilson and Dutchman by Amira Baraka and Baldwin. And I... 
that first week told I had 28 students, told my students to write scenes from their life as if it was a dramatic scene. So I took that first stack of papers home and read through them and found three or four that were brilliant. I had attracted three or four of the best writers in the prison. This went on for a few more weeks and I decided that I would help them write a play about life in prison. And I was supposed to be working on my book, Wages of Rebellion, but I stopped. And I added another night to the class, which you can only add another night in the prison system if students need remedial help. So I wrote my entire class down as needing remedial help. <laughs> and um, after four months, we put together this incredibly powerful play, which is their voices. I only have one student from that class who got out. His name is Boris. He's now at Rutgers. Uh, you know, the, these guys are amazing. I, I have, I teach the BA, mostly the BA students, so it's self-selected. I taught women this spring. I can talk about that. I was in the women's correctional facility this spring. Um, and you have a certain segment of that prison population that turns their cells into libraries. So I met Boris at 7.30 in the morning when he got out with his mother. And this is a guy who'd been incarcerated for 11 years. And the first words out of his mouth were to me, I have to rebuild my library. When you're poor and you leave 100 books behind, that is a monumental investment. And when we finished that play, it was really, I would say, I remember one week I said, I want you to write about just a conversation with your mother. And one of my students after class said, well, what if we're a product of rape? And I said, okay, well, Timmy, that's what you gotta write. So what he writes, which was autobiographical, is that he's in a car in Patterson, New Jersey with his half-brother. The car is stopped and searched. His half-brother has a weapon. Now, if someone in the car doesn't take ownership of that weapon, everybody is charged with weapons possession. And Timmy says to the police, it's mine. And then he writes the conversation he has with his mother from the county jail, which goes, it doesn't matter, Ma, I was never supposed to be here anyway and you have the son you love. That's why he's in prison. And when we read the play, I couldn't perform it because it's something that the corrections officers would not like. But I invited Cornell West and James Cone, America's greatest theologian, to come hear it. And so when Timmy got up and read that section, of course he was weeping, and they're all, I'm like a munchkin in there, they're all gigantic. And uh, I couldn't, I said to the students after the play, where's Timmy? They said, I think he's in the men's room. And I found him just huddled, shaking, weeping in the corner. And that last night, all of them signed that play. And I had taught... Joe Turner, Come and Gone, the great August Wilson play, where African Americans are going north, struggling with the trauma of slavery, trying to reconnect with families that were broken apart during slavery. And Byron Walker's a conjurer who said, you can't be whole until you find your song. And I said to my students, this is your song. And I don't know anything about producing plays. But I'm going to take that play to every director I can find. And next spring, the professional theater in Trenton will mount the play if starting on the 31st, I can raise $60,000 on Kickstarter. So even if you don't have money, that's fine. 
just send the link out because these people have no resources at all and I want their song to be heard. Thank you. That's the, that's the 31st of this month. And where do they go for Kickstarter? I, I don't, I'm not very good on social media. I'm not running it. But I guess there must be a Kickstarter website, right? <laughs> Is that how it works? There will be a link. Huh? There will be a link. On Kickstarter? Maybe we can get Kabu to do a link. Yeah, oh, okay. that's a good idea. All right. Okay, I guess we're... Uh, I just wanted to say we're, we're happy to get that link out for you, absolutely. You. So keep an eye out on our Facebook page and emails and stuff, so we'll make sure that you hear about it. Okay, I guess we're uh, wrapped up. Thank you. Chris Hedges, everyone.